She's poor and crazy. She rents a room in a house and fills it with junk, then gets kicked out and moves to another room and fills that one with junk. Hello, welcome to my home. Hello. Please come in. All right, well, I will take you down here to my apartment. Um, people have often said that it's not the cleanest, but you know, I really don't see a problem. Yes. Uh, please come in and take a look. Um, so you can see here some of my very important possessions. This box is, I haven't moved, but I might move, so I might need a box. And like a pillow, you know, you can't have too many pillows and, um, dog food, because if I, you know, there's ever some sort of natural disaster, I might get hungry. So. It's just these things are really necessary to me, and I've been told that, you know, I should really get rid of it, but I can't. Now, typically in situations such as these, we go back and examine the life and times, if you will, of the subject. Uh, I was born January 7th, 1945 in Ottawa, Canada, uh, to an Orthodox Jewish family. And we moved when I was raised in St. Louis, Missouri by my parents, uh, Saul and Kate Wes. I'm um, the second of six children. Yeah, you may have actually heard of my younger sister, Rabbi Tiraz Firestone. She's the uh, author of books on female figures in Jewish mysticism and the Kabbalah. Uh, School-wise, I first attended Yavna of Tel Shia near Cleveland, and then I switched to the Washington University in St. Louis for my BA. Uh, and then I did uh, a BFA in painting from the Art Institute in Chicago. Uh, while I was in living in Chicago, I actually became involved in uh, rights movements, and I organized the West Side Group, which was a predecessor of the Chicago Women's Liberation Union. Uh, in October of 67, I moved to New York and co-founded New York Radical Women. And I also began to write essays, uh, Women in the Radical Movement, the Jeanette Rank and Brigade, Women Power, and the Women's Right Movement in the USA New View. When the NYRW dissolved, Ellen Willis and I co-founded the radical feminist group Red Stockings, uh, which was actually named after the Blue Stocking Society, which was a women's literary group. I left Red Stockings to co-found New York Radical Feminists. Uh, in 1968, I edited notes from the first year, followed by notes from the second year, and then finally notes from the third year in 1971. I was 25 years old when I wrote uh, Di The Dialect of Sex, and it was actually published in 1970. Uh, it really argued that true gender equality was impossible to achieve until science freed women from their biological role as bearers of children. I envision an uh, artificial womb in which fetuses could be grown until they reached the newborn stage, and then at which point they would be uh, raised for the next several years in a commune-like household with you know, 8 to 10 adults. Uh, at this point, I really was no longer politically active, and I moved to St. Mark's Place and worked as a painter. Uh, in the late 80s, I became mentally ill, or so I've been told, and it has inspired my writing um, because in 1998, I wrote about life in and out of psychiatric hospitals, and it's titled Airless Space. Um, they say that this mental illness is, you know, manifested through my hoarding, but I just, I find it very handy to be able to come down here and find deodorant randomly, or find a bag that I need randomly. It's just, for me, this is a functional, efficient way to live. Da, 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 da. I just remember if I actually can read my own writing in that way, we won't have so many issues. So, Shuli and I, we did a lot of group forming together. Um, or hopping, I guess you could say. We definitely thought that the personal was political. It is political. Shuli was highly involved with feminist consciousness, consciousness raising um, in the 1960s women's movement. And her book needs to be read in that context, um, as it is clear that she had a philosophy of praxis. Her call to the revolution was influenced by her intellectual dialogue with both Marx and Freud. 
Specifically, Shuley builds on the Marxist concept of materialism to argue that women's oppression originates from the nature and function of female biology. Thus, it is not simply a result of social and economic positioning, as Marx and Engels claim, but for Shuley, this creates a sexual class system predicated on a sexualized division of labor, including reproduction. Biology is used to justify this class system. Since Shuley predicted technological advances in reproductive technologies, why hasn't her vision of an andro androgynous equality taken place? Oh, because women are still having babies, not machines, and children are not li liberated from the confines of the myth of childhood. Moreover, Shuley also used Freud as an intellectual springboard to argue that so oh, social sexual repression was at the root of the sociocultural disease. Shuley also sought to destroy the inhibiting nuclear family to encourage a new rational grouping of people. Scary, isn't it? Shuley predicted uh, things about technology. Maybe a cybernetic revolution will come. Or maybe Shuley will just keep on hoarding. Uh, perhaps that's from the oppressive nature of the patriarchy. Or she didn't have an orgasm. I don't know. The dialectic of sex is still so influential to feminism and women everywhere. The idea that we could and like still can seize the means of reproduction was so important. Like I said in my interview with Gloria Steinem, I would rather talk about Shulamith than Madonna. I thought Madonna was really cool. I wanted to be like her, you know, like in the desperately seeking Susan era. She was just really hot and like who didn't want to be like her. But it's the same as looking in Seventeen magazine and trying to be and look like all those other girls. Also, I mean, I went to college in the early 90s and everybody was getting into popular culture and theorizing about pop popular culture and there's something interesting about that and then there's something really really stupid about it where it just goes too far and you're like I want to talk about True Myth Firestone and Ellen Willis I don't really want to talk about Madonna I mean she wrote a best-selling book and so many people don't even know who she is people like True Myth are so important I feel like every time has been the right time really for important feminist works I'm just really obsessed with second wave history is all because like things aren't going to change until we have a continuum and I feel like I need mentors. I need to learn from people's mistakes instead of feeling like I have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. Like, I know that Gloria has experienced controversy and scandal in her career, and I've had some of things where people were discussing backbiting and horizontal oppression and disguising it as valid criticism. And I need to know how, as an FF or like famous feminist, to deal with these things. I need to see the grace of ways that other women have dealt with that. It was really terrible at first to be labeled and heralded as this leader of the cause because I didn't want to be the leader. It was obviously a community of a lot of different women working on different fronts. I felt really embarrassed and humiliated to have been singled out in that way. And as a result, I was sometimes perceived as a traitor even though it wasn't my fault. But at a certain point, I just had to accept it and think, what can I do with this? It's funny because when I sign autographs, I write Born in Frames by Lizzie Borden, a movie that I think is genius that I think all women should probably go and see. So I use my autograph as a way to advertise that movie. Or I'll just write down a book like The Dialectic of Sex by Fulham with Firestone, or Letters to a Young Feminist by Phyllis Chester, or No More Nice Girls by Ellen Willis, and then like sign my name.